Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. From a fast rising startup formed as a gaming company in 2009 to being acquired by Salesforce late last year for over $27 billion, workplace chat app Slack is making some billion dollar moves. No surprise, Slack is now taking a bigger stab at becoming a thought leader in matters of the workplace of the future, the tools and cultural change that will enable it. In comes my next guest, Brian Elliott. The former head of platform at Slack and now a head of Future Forum, a new Slack lad consortium that aims to rethink the modern workplace. Brian spent the last two decades leading teams and building companies at Slack, Google, and a number of startups. And today, we unpack how to rethink for the way work should be, not the way it's always been. You don't want to miss this. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to Bill and Dollar Moves. I'm so excited to have with me here today my next guest, Brian Elliott. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, you know, today is um, all about billion dollar moves and, you know, beyond sort of the trends that we're talking about in venture and business, we're excited to hear about your billion dollar moves as well, personally. And, you know, when we were together on Bloomberg, I, I did a little bit of uh, background research on you and I was just thinking to myself, wow, this guy has been really ahead of the trends, you know, with your time in Google and at Google Express with the future of e-commerce at that time and joining Slack in 2018 and already having discussions about the future forum with Stuart, um, even as Slack was going through some really big things in the in the headlines. So tell us a little bit about what brought you here. Yeah, so like dialing all the way back, uh, former startup CEO uh, uh, that was a consultant before that and then ended up at Google and then Slack. The one thing that I learned pretty quickly and largely through the School of Hard Knocks is that it's all about people. It's all about your team. It's all about how good are you at engaging uh, talented, diverse groups of people uh, to help them aggro- avoid groupthink, uh, to help them achieve a bigger mission in your company. And I kind of carried that with me uh, from sort of one company to the next, to my experience at Google, to my experience at Slack. And it was probably two weeks into my time at Slack when Stuart Butterfield, uh, Slack's co-founder and CEO, said to me and a couple other people, we should have a think tank. We should have a center for the future of work. We should have some way in which we are helping articulate our vision in the world. And we're all interested, but it was also one of those things where it's like, we're really busy. We have a lot going on right now. And sure. so it's just the right time uh, and place to do that. Fast forward to um, uh, exactly this time last year, we had basically moved everybody, done this lift and shift, moved everybody out of working in offices to working from home, including at Slack, where mm. before the pandemic, only 3% of our employees were remote based. Oh, and wow. we we're undergoing this great experiment. And what, what happened was a bunch of us, Stuart, myself, other executives, found ourselves in conversations with customers and with um, other executives and partners that weren't about just the product or the technology they were about teams and they were about policies and processes and what were we learning? What were we gonna take away from all this? And we got to talking about it again and then kind of came back to this, we really should be doing something about this. We have our own perspective about a very human-centered future of work. Think about Slack's mission. We wanna make work, uh, we wanna make your work life simpler, more pleasant, more productive. It's all centered on the individual person. And so this was the right time to pick this up and and do something about it that was a little deeper. Yeah, and and that's really amazing that, um, you know, there was that foresight, you know, for um, just even, I I think what was said was this time of a pandemic has really accelerated what was already going to happen, uh, compressed it, but, you know, many were not prepared. And as you said, you know, this concept of lift and shift, I I really picked up one of your quotes there, which is what really happened was uh, we assumed the exact same things, right? Stuffed our calendars with the nine to five and just tossed it into our homes without any 
further thought in, and that's really had uh, you know some significant impact so i want to dive right in here you know taking it to where we are today to really map out the landscape and uh, one of the you know key findings that came out from your survey that, that you ran a little while ago was that 83% of knowledge workers do not want to return to the office. Uh, so, so map this out here for us, you know, what are we talking about? Um, and, and if you could as well define knowledge workers for some of our listeners who may not uh, really register that immediately and, and what, what can we look forward to? So uh, knowledge workers are people that are, generally speaking, folks that you think of as being office workers, uh, people that are uh, doing creative content, people that are doing sales, people that are doing engineering, marketing campaigns, accounting, uh, those types of roles. They're typically the roles that people think of as being in you know, headquarters, central office. Knowledge work really also extends out, and we can get into that uh, over time as well, into how mm -hmm. people think about the role of a retail worker. But what we did is we did some fundamental research. We, we actually, uh, in Q3 and again in Q4, had a survey instrument uh, that ran through 9,000 knowledge workers in the US, UK, Germany, France, Japan, and Australia, helping understand what was working and what wasn't for people who are both back in offices, people who are part-time in offices, and people who are working remotely. And you know, it's been a really hard year. It's been a really dramatically challenging year for a number of people. If you think about the conditions of working during a pandemic, you've got um, you know, uh, parents with children, especially women with children that are often dealing with childcare at home at the same time. You had people that were sick, you had people that were in space that was inappropriate, and you had all kinds of growing signs of systemic racism. That all of that was happening though at the same time that people were suddenly experiencing this sort of change in uh, what the conditions of work were. For a long time, a lot of companies simply thought that people would not be productive working at home. And what happened last March is they had to actually give it a try. And as companies gave it a try, so did people. And people found that their expectations changed. So what came back in our survey is whether you were in an office or working remotely, only 20% of knowledge workers around the globe wanted to go back to five days a week in the office. Only 17% want full-time remote, never going right. to an office. What most people want is a blend. They want flexibility. They want the ability to come together in shared space for social connection, for team building, potentially for project kickoffs, but not mm -hmm. for the everyday work that they're getting able to get done at home just as well, in fact, better, according to most studies, including ours, and get back some time in their lives get back a little bit of work-life balance, cut the commute, all the stuff that we've grown to appreciate. Sure. So so it's interesting that you point out, you know, some of the pros there, but obviously um, there are some real cons and, and you, you touched on it very lightly, you know, it, it's disproportionately affecting certain groups. Uh, I really want to hear more about what, what you think then and why why this is the case. Yeah, so there, there's, there's a couple of things that have been somewhat universal and then there's things that actually cut very differently depending on who you are. The universal things have been people struggling with uh, social isolation and sense mm -hmm. of belonging. It's just been a hard year all around. And that's true in your work setting as much as it is in your personal setting. I would like to get out of the house more often. Right. Um, beyond that, you can see the, the, in, our start, in our survey, there's a big, big challenge in terms of ability, people's ability to focus. And quite often that can be individual situational. So we know based on our data, for example, that women Women with children have had a disproportionately more challenging time in the last year. I'm a proud father myself. I'd love to be able to say it's parents with children, but it's not. It's, it's yeah. um, women with children much more so. Uh, it's strongest in the US, uh, second worst in the UK. It gets a little bit better in some other countries where they have a little bit more childcare infrastructure, potentially some different cultural norms. But it's been really hard because especially for companies and places that have done that lift and shift, that have taken a nine to five day worth of meetings and pushed it into video, uh, it's been virtually impossible for a lot of people. And we've seen that play out in the news, right? We've seen the fact that in, in the US, a million women have basically been forced out of the labor market because they had to make a stark choice between um, what they were seeing at home and what they were seeing at work. Um, there's some other areas that have some bright spots and some negative spots. Uh, we've gone deeper on the experience of black employees in the US uh, and from that perspective, we saw signs of systemic racism at work as well. They're feeling like they were being supported by their manager. They're feeling like uh, they were able to be recognized at work was actually worse than their white colleagues. But at the same time, they're a group that far that is far less likely to say they wanna come back to five days a week in the office. So when we split right. the data, 21% of white employees wanna come back to work full-time uh, in five days a week, only 3% of black employees. 
And their sense of belonging is actually better working remotely than it was working in the office and better than white employees. So, hmm. so, so, so unpack that a little bit for me. I mean, the sense of belonging is better when they're remote. So we've, we've, there's, a, there's a group that we've partnered with called Management Leadership for Tomorrow that focuses on uh, leadership development uh, among historically discriminated uh, populations, especially in the knowledge worker industry. We've worked with them and a number of academics. And what's come back somewhat consistently is it's the cost of code switching. It's the challenge of, uh, as Brian Lowry, a Stanford prof professor, put it to us, um, if I have to come into a majority white work environment on a nine to five basis, five days a week, I have to constantly think about the fact that am I using the um, standard terminology, norms, behavioral language of a white majority workplace? If I'm able to work from home even a few days a week, I get a break from that. If I'm able to go back and forth, if I'm able to dial in for a meeting, then dial back out, I can get a little bit of um, almost uh, relief from doing that. And so there are ways in which flexibility in where you work uh, ben is benefiting that group in the yeah. same way that flexibility in schedules is really essential and an essential ingredient, but neither of these are cure-alls for um, uh, people with children, especially women with children. Yeah, and you know, with the point on, on women, it's um, the, the World Economic Forum published a global gender re report recently, and, and we've really taken steps backwards. I think it's what, 135.6 uh, years now compared to 99 years uh, for us to get to parity. And, and that speaks uh, volumes to where we have to go in, in moving forward. And, and I think a lot of what you spoke about, you know, even the fact that uh, different employees uh, and, and taking into account sort of the systemic racism that we've all been through. And it's been a hard year of, of reckoning, a hard year for, for many of us. Um, what does this tell you? I mean, I know you work in, in the systems and, and, and the enablement, but from a leadership perspective, you're working with the CEOs, you know, the, the CEOs who are thinking about how do I do best for my employees? What does this tell you about how they're rethinking um, building their culture and, and building one that's sustainable for the long run, accommodating different groups? So there are things that come out both out of our research and out of our conversations with executives that are pretty clear in terms of things that you can do. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to watch as different companies decide whether they're going to adapt these adopt these practices or not. The concept of distributed workforces, hiring people in more distributed geographies, obviously has some benefits in terms of things like your ability to hit a more a, a broader talent pool, right? The other thing is it, do, it does is helps you tap into a more diverse talent pool. So if you think about like what Levi Strauss and company who's based here in San Francisco faces or Nike, which is in Beaverton, Oregon, the black community uh, is not as strong there. If you look at McKinsey's uh, research over the past couple of weeks, they've released 60 some odd percent of the black employee inflation, uh, black employee population in the US is in the Southeast. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about how you're gonna diversify your workforce, you're gonna have to think about how do you think, of, how do you build up more geographically distributed uh, workforce. That work flexibility in terms of time is also really essential. So we've watched uh, different companies struggle with this for years in terms of how do I think about breaking that standard nine to five. We're doing experiments internally ourselves and we don't always succeed in this to be honest, but my team has, for example, a 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. core team work hours that we use. And that says, keep your meetings with the team, keep all of my one-on-ones with the team, keep the work that we do together in that window. And that way people have more flexibility about when they do individual work. By the way, that benefits their individual work. Yeah. And it also benefits the fact that they often uh, have childcare situations they need to deal with or go get a vaccine, um, right. other things that we're all striving for. So adapting policies around flexibility about where people work and when they work can mm -hmm. actually benefit the diversity of your workforce. That's, that's interesting that you put it that way. Um, and, you know, it, it brings to mind a couple of things about um, just different workplaces. And I know, you know, right now you're working across the globe. We just talked about that, how you're, you know, you've had calls early in the morning all across the globe um, working with these different companies. And I, I come from Malaysia and I remember some of my early experiences where, you know, even thinking about being away from your desk, even though um, it's a sales job or, or something that's client interfacing, um, there's some level of, what needs to change, I think, in certain cultures, in terms of trust, in terms of um, building for autonomous work. Um, are you seeing this change across the globe? How are different cultures dealing with the fact that, you know, this is the new reality? We're, we're seeing a healthy debate is what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of different places. And what I mean by that is 
that we we also see this in terms of the pressure that people are feeling, especially uh, frontline managers. If your company and your team is used to measuring um, whether or not a person is performing based on whether or not they're in the office, if they're used to measuring it on some measure of productivity, which has to do with volume metrics or how long they're plugged in, then you're actually struggling even more in the current situation. What we're starting to see is companies starting to think harder about like, work is now so dynamic. Markets are so dynamic. I need to find a way to solve for outcomes driven measurements of whether or not somebody is being productive. At which point where they work matters to me a lot less other than are they able to plug in and be with their teammates when they need to be. So, you know, more progressive companies aren't thinking about this solely from a perspective of diversity is good. And it is because it actually drives better business results, right. but also because they can start thinking about things from a I have broader purpose that I want to instill in my team and my organization. I have outcomes I want them to achieve. There are things like customer satisfaction. There are things like usage of my product. There are things like revenue growth. What those aren't is uh, the day-to-day -day minutia of activities. It's not how fast somebody responds to a message. It's whether or not they're doing good work and that work mm. is moving the results at the end of the day. So, so that's interesting in the in the way you're thinking about sort of the outcomes and the outputs versus the I guess the the day to day. So, tell tell me a little bit about uh, what you're seeing in terms of just the way companies and the way leaders are restructuring. Um, you know, just within even within their companies, right? I mean, the the hard truth is if we take a, a little bit of a zoom out um, of what's happening is because of things being remote, uh, those that are in person, there are a lot of jobs that are going to be removed uh, that are no longer relevant. And again, you know, back to the point of how this pandemic has really compressed um, the future that we were already expecting. Uh, what what are you seeing leaders do to reskill and just prepare their company as they move yeah. forward right now? Yeah, you, you touched on, the, I think, the key word there, which is reskilling. Those programs have become more and more important. There, there's a set of challenges that are going to continue to be created by automation that historically have been, you know, the, 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 the productivity that automation has created has resulted in net job gain, but for different people, right? And so the gap mm -hmm. here is as certain jobs become either reduced or potentially made more obsolete, how do you take that group of people and train them up with a different set of skills? And what most companies recognize is that the people that are already good, productive employees of your organization, it's much cheaper to help them develop and build new skill sets than it is to go and hire people where even finding those skill sets can often be a challenge, but you also then have to get them into an understanding of the culture of your business. So you're starting to see more investment by major companies in things that are reskilling programs, but also even things that help people cross the opportunity divide. So four-year college degrees aren't necessary for every job. And in fact, they're really hard to find for a large number of people who don't have that opportunity. So how are companies thinking about taking an approach that says, I'm after something that gets you the certification of skills, I'm gonna help you on that journey in return, mm -hmm. which I'm getting a loyal employee that I can continue to train and help them grow and nurture their career. And so I think we're gonna see that sort of application of continuous learning have to get applied at every level. It's gonna be applied at the early introductory stage level. It's gonna be applied at later stage in your career when you know, some of the jobs in accounting start getting shifted into other uh, formats. And right. importantly, it's going to be applied to managers as well. Right. And and I guess then the big question, you know, we have a lot of senior executives um, tuning in. And the big question is, what is this all going to cost us? Right. We talk about uh, early on, you know, top of the, the show here, we talked about what people want, right? What the employees want. They want, you know, a hybrid. They want this and that. Um, and it's it's nice to hear, but for someone in the position where you're writing the check and trying to figure out, like you know, with even decline in certain revenues for certain businesses, we, we talked in on Bloomberg about you know the the bounce back, but it's not equally distributed. So how are leaders thinking about this, and how is this was this going to cost us? So I, I think it's really interesting to ask people to start thinking about the metrics, not just for the thing that you're investing in, but what's it offsetting. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, reskilling of employees is actually still a really good example on that front. The amount that you spend to train somebody who's already an employee of yours is probably a lot less than your recruiting costs, plus your ramp up time on a new employee that comes into your organization as one example. I think that the majority of what we're looking at in terms of more distributed uh, workforce is actually a net benefit to companies, but we shouldn't think about it that way. So, mm -hmm. for example, 
Um, the majority of real estate inside of office buildings quite often is housing of individual workers. We have on average shrank the square footage per knowledge worker uh, in the Western world by 50% over the past couple of decades. The open office floor plan has gotten smaller, but it's still really expensive. If you've got the opportunity to hire people in a more distributed fashion, you're not going to get rid of all the office space, but you might shrink it some. You might get some benefits of people that you're hiring in slightly lower wage versus higher wage areas. But I think at the end of the day, most of this comes back to it's about talent. If you are competing in this age, you're not competing on the basis of access to capital or physical uh, uh, assets. Typically, what you're competing on is can I bring in the most talented people possible? Can I get them aligned against my mission and my vision? Can I make them productive and can I retain them uh, and, put, and help them uh, help me drive forward? So things that actually improve employee retention, things that actually help improve employee engagement are known to boost productivity, are known to boost outcomes. So the best, the best investments you can make are often small ones that are more about how do you allow flexibility? They're often about how do you make sure people are using you know, best, most modern technologies? Um, mm -hmm. Those are the things that are actually going to yield uh, outsized results versus very big you know, CapEx expenditures. Right. And, and I think, you know, again, you, you spoke about part of your personal journey and uh, I like your anecdote there about culture and, and sort of uh, bringing the best out of your talent. What, what are you um, seeing to be some of the ways that senior leaders are building these cultures that will be, you know, what's needed in bringing out the best in their talent, even as they're distributed and diverse. I think, you know, one of the big things that we both are aligned on, and, and I think we gravitated towards each other because of this, is that diversity does uh, bring good business. It's good for us all. But, you know, that the hard truth is uh, to facilitate that, right, takes some level of leadership. And it's about how do you, um, you know, toss off each other and, and build those systems to create for success. And, and so what are you seeing here in terms of what leaders are doing to do that? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things uh, to, uh, to unpack there. One is social emotional skills are the most important skills from a leadership perspective. That's been true for a long time. It's becoming increasingly true though. The more mm -hmm. that technology automates quantitative skills, the more important it is that your leaders actually have the ability to inspire confidence in their teams, to help them build trust in one another, to give them you know, psychological safety. Um, it's also, you know, besides putting those skills in place, it's important, therefore, as a leadership team to think about how are you building teams that have some of those dynamics and how, is you, how are you as an executive team representing uh, those different points of view? I'll give you a, a couple of concrete examples. If you were thinking about going with a more distributed model, but if all of your executives show back up on the same floor of the same building five days a week and you've told your team that they can have flexibility in where and when they work, you've given them a very false sense of flexibility, right? Because power dynamics are what they are. If all of your executive team shows up on the same floor, every other person who has career aspirations is gonna to wanna to get in there for meetings. So we've started doing things at Slack, for example, where our, our um, Nadia Rollinson, our chief human resource officer was hired in Chicago. Slack sort of kind of had an office in Chicago before this, but uh, she's our first senior executive in there. Stuart is very seldom in San Francisco, right? We've intentionally thought about where and when will, employ, when will our executives show back up? How are we gonna think about how as executives we bring together not only a more diverse uh, set of viewpoints, but also importantly, how we think about um, building up uh, patterns that don't um, fall back into old norms that then therefore bring everybody else back. Yeah, I like that, I like that. Well, Brian, you know, this has been a great discussion. I mean, you know, it is a short window, but I did want to make sure we are able to capture uh, some of the billion dollar moves that you are seeing. You know, some of the people that are tuning here are working on their startups, getting from one to 10 and scaling uh, and dealing with multiple challenges. Everything that we've talked about, about the pressures of the pandemic, the real mental burnout that this is causing um, with everything that's happening around us being, you know, having to juggle everything. Uh, what, what are some of the billion dollar moves that you'll be recommending to some of the founders and funders and, and execs that are tuning in here? So three words, flexibility, inclusiveness, and connected. So flexibility, um, hiring a, from a wider uh, range of geographies is gonna help you in terms of the breadth of your talent pool and the depth of your talent pool and the diversity mm -hmm. of it. Flexibility forces you in terms of schedule, helps you, forces you to rethink how many hours a day you wanna have your team spending in meetings. Inclusiveness, study after study after study shows that a diverse talent uh, team at the executive level drives differential results for companies. 
Rule number one as an executive, look around the table. If you are finding big gaps at the table, ask yourself why and what are you doing to close those gaps? Number three, connected. The, the people, the companies that have performed best in this are the people that are innovating. They're thinking about digital tools and new processes and new ways of working together that aren't reliant just on taking, you know, a calendar chunk of half an hour, adding a Zoom uh, meeting into it, and that's the way we're going to get work done. They're doing much richer, like rethinking of onboarding processes, of apprenticeship programs, of creativity and collaboration, all powered by digital tools and technologies. So flexible, inclusive, and connected. Great. And last words on, you know, now that we're uh, a little bit further along with the end of the tunnel of uh, the pandemic here, and yet, you know, still with the background of a lot of uh, uncertainty still, what what are your thoughts on the outlook for what's next um, for the economy? And, you know, with the conversations that you're having, which I think is super interesting, where you get to see how teams are thinking about what next for their workforce, you know, whether they're sizing down, whether they're sizing up, uh, what does this all do in terms of the recovery? I, I may be, you know, the, the eternal optimist in some ways, but I see huge opportunities here in terms mm -hmm. of both pent up demand from a consumer perspective around things like travel, around experiences, around restaurants that will help, you know, some of the industries that have been hit the hardest by all of this. And I see a real opportunity from a leadership perspective to really grab this moment and use it for all its challenges and all of its problems to rethink how you want to come back out of this. How do you take the best of what you've learned uh, and help help it ha have it help you drive forward? And I think the people do, they're going to win from a war for talent perspective. And that's going to be a real determinant of a decade from now, who's sitting in the Fortune 100. I love it. Well, Brian, thanks so much. This is the end of the first part of our show where we really, uh, you know, talk through quite a, a fair bit there in a short amount of time, you know, in terms of the trends, the sense of belonging, uh, the fact that our employees want a lot more of us. And I, I think as leaders, it's, it's incumbent upon us to step up and really reframe to ensure that we're really getting the most out of uh, what's next in, in our future. So thank you, Brian, for, for joining us today. And we'll, for those of you tuning in, we are jumping on to Clubhouse in just a minute. Uh, so catch you on there on Invest Club. And we've got a couple of guests that are joining us on there as well to be chatting through uh, some of the hot things that are hot trends, hot things uh, that are going on in the future of work and the challenges, the opportunities and what's next. So thanks and we'll see you again next week.